Welcome to the Indie Nola First Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our prayer is that this message will inspire you, encourage you, and launch you into life-changing action. Uh, uh, when I was a kid, there was this restaurant, I guess, a drive-in restaurant um, that was in our small town of Slate, Slayton, Minnesota. I almost said Slaytona. We used to make fun of it that way. But Slayton, Minnesota. And um, we had this drive-in. It was right on the west end of town. And it was called the Hub Drive-In. And it's good food. Donnie, you've eaten there, right, with me? Yeah, it's good food. And it wasn't open during the wintertime because it's really cold up there. And nobody goes to a drive-in when it's cold, right? So they would close for the winter. And that actually became a real key to their business because everybody was so excited about the Hub Drive-In opening up. You know, when summer hit or when the tempers got, temperatures got warm in the spring. And, uh, you know, they were a normal restaurant. They had a lot of ice cream type things. And they had, um, you know, uh, the, the great burgers and fries and, and uh, deep fried cheddar crisps that were just, they were so good. Um, nice and greasy and a little salt on there. And... I'm hungry now, sorry. <laughs> I worked myself up into a lather. A lather of hunger. Um, but they had this ice cream machine, and I, I don't know if anybody knows about ice cream machines. I suppose if you work in refrigeration, you do. Uh, Eric, they're real fun to work on, aren't they? Those nice ice cream machines. And um, This was one that was pretty important. They sold a lot of ice cream, and my dad was a refrigeration guy. And so my dad would just, he, he really liked them as a customer. He was good to them. They always paid their bills on time. How many know if you own a business, it's easier to... Uh, 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 give that, those kind of customers who pay their bills on time a little more attention, right? That'll come up later. So he would go in and he'd fix the ice cream machine and he was always there for them. He always would do things right. He would always, you know, not overcharge them. He'd just treat them fairly because they treated him fairly. And a lot of you know that my dad passed away almost 11 years ago and it was about five or six years ago that my mom moved from my childhood home in, near that town, and she moved to South Dakota. And um, I, was, I went back to my, the, the, the house that I grew up in, back to my hometown, before we had everything moved out, and I helped do a few things in the house, helped pack a few things up kind of thing. And I think that's when you were with me, Pastor Donnie. You came and helped me, which was wonderful. Um, and on the way out of town, I was like, we got to stop by the Hub Drive-In, because I'm not going to be back in this town in a while. I mean, I have no really reason to go back there that don't really know any or have any relatives right there in town anymore. So I, we stopped in there, and we sat down. Now, this has been about six years since my dad had passed away. And um, I look a little like my dad, but I wouldn't say I look exactly like him. Um, and I, we were sitting in there, and the owner comes out, and he comes over, and he goes, you're Bob Hill's boy. And I'm like, yeah. That kind of touched my heart a little bit, and he goes, dinner's on me tonight, today. And he paid for our lunch. you remember that? He paid for our lunch. And Donnie's like, well, then in that case, put a steak on there and put this. No, <laughs> he didn't. He didn't. I want to read a scripture to you, Proverbs 22.1. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. The thing about that moment when we got our lunch paid after six years of him not doing any work is that guy was just trying to tell me how much he appreciated my dad because he had a good reputation with him and with the community and how he treated people and how he served them even in his business. And it touched me. It made a difference. It, it, it made me think. I want you to understand something. Your reputation matters. It matters. And even though we are independent people with independent thoughts, I get that. We're a church full of independent people, independent thinkers, and I love that kind of church. But that doesn't give us the right to say that we don't care about what people think of us. And that may rub you the wrong way. But don't forget that you have been bought with a price. Your life is not your own. And if you live like it is your own, it may be that you're not as given over to Christ as you think you are. I'm not saying you're not saved. I just, 
I just wouldn't want to be on that thin of ice when it comes to my own salvation. The thin ice of having that attitude that I don't care what people think, I'm going to do whatever I want. It matters what people think of you because you may be the only Jesus they ever see. And if you destroy your reputation with people, how will you ever be able to lead them closer to the Lord? And I know there are those who will hate you because of Christ. I get that. There comes a moment when you, gotta, when you just got to die on a hill. I get that. But that doesn't mean that we use Christ as an excuse for people to hate us. And there's a big difference. Your reputation matters. It can either put you in a position to be used by God or in a position where nobody wants to listen to you. And here it is, church. The, the answer to this question actually matters for your life. What do people say about you when your name comes up and you're not there? What's their first thought when they think of you? Do they think integrity? Do they think loose cannon? Maybe the word they think of is lazy or maybe it's disciplined. Do they think of the admiration they have for you? Or is, it their first thought re- is their first thought regarding you a negative one? Do they think of you as a really great person or someone they would rather avoid? And again, you may say that you don't care what they think. That doesn't bother you. But it's that attitude, just a, just, is that attitude just a way to shrug off your God-given responsibilities? To be esteemed by others is better than silver or gold. Having a good name in the community is more desirable than riches. Let that verse sink into your spirit today. Because our reputation, what people say about us and what they think of us, that has value. Look at what the Bible says about elders or pastors, overseers in the church. Now the overseer must be above reproach. The husband of but one wife. This is 1 Timothy 3, 2 2 through 8. Temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation, did you hear that? A good reputation with outsiders, it's those outside the church, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So one of the prerequisites for leaders in the church is that they must have a good reputation with those outside the church. It's impossible to have a good reputation with those outside the church if you have the attitude that you don't care what they think. And that doesn't mean you fall into people-pleasing or that you compromise the truth in in what you say or do. I'm not talking about compromising or, or holding truth back or anything like that. It just means that true leaders are wise enough to speak truth in the right way and at the right time. And if this is required of spiritual leadership, why would everyone else in the church get a pass on it? Again, your life is not your own, church. You have been bought with a price, and that price was the spilt blood of Jesus Christ, crucified on a cross. And I know this might be a little challenging for some of you. I, again, know how independent, especially some of you, can be. <laughs> but as long, maybe, the, maybe it's as long as my conscience is clean, I'm going to do what I want. I don't care what others think. But we have to be balanced your reputation with others both in and outside the church will always determine your ability to minister to those same people and when you look at it like that a good reputation is not just a valuable thing that's desirable above silver or gold it's a responsibility that we have as blood-bought children of God it's our responsibility to maintain a good reputation There is a responsibility of reputation, a responsibility to Jesus, the purchaser of our salvation. He ransomed us from hell. How many know that that's true? 
He paid the price so you wouldn't have to go there. He made a way when there was no way. He lived a perfect life, died on a cross for your sins. Your sins nailed him to the cross, literally. And he did it because he loved us. He ransomed us. He paid the price for us. We represent him now because we've allowed ourselves to be purchased. We've made the decision to serve him. And that means we represent him, which absolutely means that we need to care about our reputation. I represent Jesus, but I don't care what people think. Those phrases don't go together. 2 Corinthians 5.20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. He's making his appeal to those that are lost in the world through us. We're his ambassadors. The rest of the verse says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled unto God. How can you do that if you don't give one iota or a hoot or whatever you want to say about what people may think of how you carry yourself in the community, how you act. I'm not talking about putting on airs, okay? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what people see in you, your real reputation. And if we are as representatives, we had better make sure that we care about what others think of us and how serving our God has changed us. I'm drilling this scripture today. Your reputation matters. It absolutely matters. A good name is more desirable than riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Earlier this week, I got to spend a couple of days with some leadership of the Assemblies of God. And it was a fairly small group, so it was conducive for a lot of personal storytelling and just sharing some great things about what's happening in the Assemblies of God nationally. It was it was. Real honor to be there. I don't even know how I got there, but I got there. And we met in a metropolitan area at a growing church's new campus. This is a, this is a church that runs about 10,000 people across all of its campuses on Sunday morning. They look for strategic places to plant a church where they can win the people around that church to the Lord. How many think that's pretty awesome? It's really cool. And they pray and they seek God where to best to place those churches. And they found this area of their city that is notorious for the artistic flair. And it's notorious for its little quaint coffee shops and loft apartments and little bars and restaurants and shops. The nightlife is busy. And I have to tell you, it's really become the hot spot for the gay community. It is very, I like to say, artsy-fartsy. Very much that way. Weird things hanging on the walls and people going, oh. A lot of decorating is exposed brick and real 100-year-old wood beams going up. I mean, I, it, it's just the whole area of towns like that. And it's cool. It's a cool look. But this area is just full of People that need Jesus, if I can say it that way. And the city is proud of this little area. It's got this industrial modern flair, like I said. Um, everything in that area is really expensive, too. But the church decided that this was the perfect place to plant another one of its campuses. And the city wouldn't have... You know, they're not going to give them a building. They're not going to allow them to buy something up there because anything that comes up for sale, they're going to buy it in a second and try to, try to grow this artsy area of a celebration of, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm holding back because I don't want to ruin my reputation, okay? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, they, what they did was they, um, they decided that they would rent this uh, event center that was down there. Now, this event center that's right in the middle of the area is one of the most sought-after event centers in Minneapolis, especially for weddings. 
So a wedding there to walk in the building and use it just for the ceremony, 10 grand. Seems like a lot, but we know of places that charge more than that um, around here, for, but that's just for the ceremony. The average wedding there costs 100 grand. 100 grand. They're book solid. In fact, when the church wanted to rent the facility, there was some pushback from the gay community because there had been some gay marriages that had happened there, and they, those couples did not want a church defiling the space in which they received and got their marriage. I mean, this is, this is the kind of place this is. I just want you to understand. And they hate Christians because Christians have notoriously hated them and not treated them with grace. So the church rented on Sundays, was able to rent this space on Sundays just for the morning for $26,000 a month. Just on Sunday morning, a little window of time they could go in there, have church, and leave. Church has been going for a couple years. It grew to about five, six hundred people, and then COVID hit. Right? So COVID hits, and this is what happens. I, I, I get, and I'm telling this story long because it's it's important to the message. There, in the process of them renting for those couple of years, they helped as much as they could the event center. They picked up after themselves. They kept things cleaner than they found them. They um, won over the manager of the facility, who was, happened to be a gay man, and he didn't change his lifestyle or anything like that, but he learned to actually appreciate the church and really like them. So they're, they're, they, they, through their reputation, through how they acted, they started to change how that community felt about them, which is really important for them to reach the community. Then, COVID hit, all the events were canceled. In this particular city, I mean, churches were not allowed to meet whatsoever. And so the church, and people can argue about this, you can get mad about this, whatever, I'm just telling you a story. They decided that they would honor that, they would step back, they would not meet, but they would still pay their $26,000 a month. Well, what happened was, as COVID came to a close, the event center was, I mean, it went broke, right? Like a lot of places did. And he didn't offer the building to the city, which is, this is 77,000 square feet of brick building, old 100-year-old brick, just to give you a little bit of, of taste of what it is. It, it's like a dungeon. It was built in the late 1800s, I believe, or early 1900s, it's over 100 years old, as the first storage unit in America that was fireproof. It's just solid concrete everywhere. I, I wish I would have put pictures up, but they busted out floors with, with like sledgehammers and the jagged edges of the walls that held up the floor. They're just all exposed, and it just looks old. It looks like, it looks like a dungeon. And then they hung beautiful chandeliers in there, the event center. That's what this place was. Some of you would have loved it. Is gorgeous in its own way. Then it was a theater. It became a theater for a while. That's why they busted out the walls. Then it became the event center. But here's the deal. The place was all set up for them to have church in this artsy area of town. And the owner of the building did not offer it to the city, which the city would have drooled over to have this building. They decided, let's offer it to the church. So the church bought the building for $10 million. Didn't, yeah, that's a lot of money. And now they own this huge building. We got a tour of it. It's like the scariest place you ever walked through. <laughs> and they're just so excited about it because it is right in the right place at the right time to win the people that need Jesus the most. And I'm telling you, none of it would have happened if they would have had the attitude, we don't care what people think. We're going to take this gospel message that we know is true and we're going to ram it down people's throats. Church, that don't work. And you know how hard it is to be around the same people that we, groups of people that we were saved from. And we avoid those people sometimes because we don't want to get sucked back into it. And that's good advice if you're a weak, mealy mouthed Christian who can't stand up for their faith. You can stand up and not be a jerk, you can be bold and not be nasty to people. 
You see what I'm saying? Your reputation matters. It absolutely matters. Some of you think, who would pay $10 million for a church in a place like that? Somebody who loves those people enough to get the gospel message to them. And I hope we're a church like that. Because what, more, what, what, what are we here for but to win people to Jesus? What else matters? What really matters in the, in the whole scope of everything going on in our world and, and, and in, in our lives if we don't do anything about touching someone for Jesus? Touching their hearts, pulling them in, compelling them to come in as Christ's ambassadors, reconciling people unto God. That's our duty. That's our calling. That's our job. That's why we got saved, church. <clears throat> Again, my point is that the, the reputation of the church and its leadership in that area is the only reason they were able to purchase the building. A good standing with the community, a good name, opened the door for them to reach that same community. <clears throat> Toss me my water, bro. <laughs> Thank you. It's empty. As I've talked with individuals over the years about Jesus and about church, it's amazing how you hear the same kinds of things over and over. Many have been let down by the church or feel looked down upon by those in the church, judged by them, the church doesn't love me, the church has been rude to me. And sometimes those situations are people misreading things wrong and the church really didn't act in an evil way. I, I get that. But sometimes they have. Sometimes they have done some things that aren't right. Now, whether it's an empty excuse or not, you know, for them not coming to Christ or being involved in church, it, that's between them and God. But it should at least help us be aware that we must be careful not to make people feel judged or shamed. It's also true that even if we cross the line a little bit, that the devil often blows it up in their heads and we can come off looking legalistic and judgmental. Churches that want to build his kingdom until he comes again don't act like the moral policemen of the community around them. I'm going to say that again. Churches that want to build his kingdom until he comes again don't act like the moral police of the community around them. I'm not saying that they, sh they shouldn't call sin sin. I didn't say that. I'm not going soft here, okay? Th th this guy don't, don't, isn't very soft anyway, so you, you understand where I'm coming from. I'm not saying that we shouldn't call sin, sin, but caring enough about people and their eternities also requires a Holy Spirit-led approach. This will always keep you in the balance of maintaining a good reputation with those outside the church while not compromising the message of the gospel. And the church as a whole seems to have problems with this. Not, not this church necessarily, but the church, Big C Church, the church at, at large. It's like a pendulum that swings between total legalism and hyper-grace. And you're one or the other a lot of times as a church. You're total legalism or you're hyper grace. And it changes sometimes in a church through the decades. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Exhibiting grace to those that need Jesus is wonderful until you water down the message so much that the idea of repentance is lost. There has to be repentance for salvation. We can't lose sight of salvation's mandate for repentance. If we do, that's a problem for our reputation as a Bible-believing followers of Christ kind of church. We must be prayed up. We must be led of the Holy Spirit. It's the only way we can possibly hold on to our good reputation while preaching the truth at the same time. Try and accomplish this in your own humanity, and, and, and you're going to fail. You're going to fail. Try to accomplish it in your own ability as a, as a human. You're going to fail at that. You can't do it. Our, our ministry director of leadership training and development in, in, the, in the Iowa Ministry Network, which is what we're a part of with the Assemblies of God. Um, his name is Derek Boyvin, and he said this to me last week. We were got to talk about legalism versus moral liberalism, right? And that's that hyper grace. You can do anything you want. Jesus' grace will cover it. It's okay. 
And people actually are living there in that spot. Moral, liber moral liberalism. But he said this, and I thought it was so good, and I wrote it down, and I'm giving him credit this one time, but I'm going to steal it and take credit the next time. But Because uh, I don't think this is uh, original to him even. But said this, legalism occurs when the church binds what God has loosed. Moral liberalism happens when the church looses what God has bound. I thought that was so good. The balance between these is liberty. That's where, it, that's where there is freedom in Christ, liberty. We don't have to be the moral police, and we shouldn't act or live as if there are no rules of conduct. This is balance. This is liberty. And our reputation as Christians who walk in liberty, not in legalism or in moral liberalism, is directly related to our ability to be effective in our witness. And I'm not saying that this is easy. It's hard to remain in that place of balance, church. It is hard. And that's just one area of reputation that we need to concern ourselves with. I've just given you one there. When we start meditating on this verse, it's amazing what the Lord will reveal to you about yourself. What's your reputation in business? Are you, are you a fair employer? Are your business dealings ethical? Or do you seek to take advantage of people? Do you pay your bills on time? Do you cheat the system wherever you can? Do you tip at restaurants? Don't even get me started on that one. I used to wait tables. It was great ministry prep. Getting to know people and talking with different kinds of people all day long. And then that person, that Christian who come after church, and they're so, you know, praise God, and they're talking about Jesus. They leave you a tip, and it's a fake $100 bill, and you open it up and it says, are you disappointed? I want to give you salvation instead. I mean, you're like, you want to throw, I just wanted to do like a karate chop to the head. You know? That's not being a witness. Sure, give the track, but put a real $100 bill in there. I bet they'll read it then. I told you not to get me started. I guess I got myself started. Sorry. What's your reputation as a parent? Are you the parent who screams at the ref during a game? Come on, that was a bad call. Get your head out of here. Oh. Or maybe you're the one screaming at your kid. I'm not saying that you should be a pushover on anything. I'm not saying that. But there are ways to speak truth into a situation while maintaining your reputation with those in the community so that you don't lose your witness. And if you don't care what people think in these scenarios, then you really don't care if those same people who may not know Jesus go to heaven or hell. You really don't care. I'm so independent, I don't even care if people go to hell. Great attitude. How you speak to your spouse in public, how you speak about your spouse in public, it matters on a number of levels, but it certainly matters in reference to your reputation. The devil is a pro at skewing perceptions, right? Why give him any ammo by the way you act or how you, how you talk or how you conduct yourself in public. He might take that and, and, and over here with someone who's lost, go, hmm, that's a Christian for you. And he might even skew it more. Why give him am ammo so that your reputation is lost? Why put yourself in a position to have your reputation marred to the point of rendering you ineffective when it comes to kingdom building? It's not worth it. You might be right, but does... Being right really justify those knee-jerk reactions that simultaneously destroy your reputation? And let's not forget that when Jesus died on the cross, he was falsely accused, he was falsely sentenced, and everything about his crucifixion was unjust. Yet he made no sound, he went like a lamb led to slaughter, and he cried out from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I don't care what people think about me. I'm just going to speak the truth. That's great, but you better speak it under the leading of the Holy Spirit at the right time and in the right way and using the right words and having a great reputation to back up what you're saying. 
sorry, I'm kind of all over the place today. I understand that. But I, I just want you to see how important it is for us to care about what others think of us in reference to our ability to minister to them. The easiest thing in the world, hear me, church. I think this is profound. The easiest thing in the world is to spout off about what you know to be true. Gather a bunch of people that think like you around yourself and then have an us for and no more gathering. But that's just plain old uniformity. Sameness. That's spiritual communism. It takes a lot more effort to maintain a solid prayer life, a strong devotional life based off the word of God, then as a result, be led by the Holy Spirit in how you handle those day-to-day situations and circumstances that make or break your reputation. And this will push you to put yourself in someone else's shoes, whoever they might be. It will cause you to operate in grace while speaking truth boldly. It will require saying you're sorry when you mess up, and it will certainly bring out a self-awareness as you look into the mirror and let the Holy Spirit speak to you. It takes effort every day and a striving that you can never relax. You can't relax that in your life because reputation is that important. I mean, you can relax your prayer life. You can relax your getting into the Word, but it isn't going to be good. But when you do that, when you live that way, led of the Holy Spirit, it will produce unity amongst people because you're truly loving them and you'll be able to speak boldly while offering grace. Unity, which brings to fruition the spiritual liberty and freedom that we all long for. It'll pull those that need Jesus in and they'll eventually become more like us. Not that we're perfect, but we're forgiven and we're saved. In the process, you will maintain, if you walk in the Spirit like that, you will maintain a good reputation that every ambassador of Christ must maintain. See, reputation matters. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be someone who is esteemed by others is better than silver or gold. It's more valuable than material wealth. And I'm not talking about being a fake. That's the other end of it. Well, I'm going to maintain my reputation, but then behind closed doors, I'm going to do whatever I want. That's a whole other sermon. But conducting yourself as a real, true, Bible-believing, blood-bought Christian in all that you say and do in the community, in all that you say and do on social media. In all that you say or do on social media. I say whatever I want. I don't care what they think of me. Maybe you should. Maybe you should. Maybe you'd win more people to Jesus. See, there's a day coming I'm not saying don't speak truth, okay? Understand, speak truth, but do it in love. Speak bold, but use grace. Liberty. Let's pray. Father God, to, to this morning, I... I just pray that this congregation has heard my heart. Because I believe with all my heart that it's your heart. Lord, we want to be the kind of people that you can use mightily. We want to care about that reputation that we have. Not not so that we can be prideful, but so that we can be used and effective. God, even when all the world is attacking us, I pray that we could walk in integrity. Even when people are slinging mud at us, God, for whatever reason, I pray that we could walk in integrity, that we could handle ourselves in ethical ways, that we could follow your word in every level of our lives. 
Father, we want to be used. We want to be in a position that at any moment, at any time, God, that you could give us a divine appointment and it wouldn't be stopped by something we said last week or how we acted in a restaurant the week before. And if there's anybody in here, Lord, that this has been a message that's hit them a little hard, I pray, God, they would know it's not too late. They can change. They can adjust their speech. They can change. And God, you can restore. You can even restore our reputations. Lord, we want to be used of you. Help us to walk in your spirit every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being a part of the Indianola First podcast. Join us next week to stay updated on our latest messages.